Okay. Um, I've been an avid birder for about a decade. I've always loved nature. Um, but, you know, it's, I didn't really know what Ohio had, what the U.S. had, what the world had as far as birds. Um, so I'm really thrilled to have kind of stumbled upon this and made it not only a, a very passionate hobby, but a career. And there's a lot of things that I do locally. Um, before I start my presentation, I do want to spend just a moment on the Ohio Young Birders Club. It is a, something that's very, very close to my heart. Working with youth, there's, there's little that's more rewarding than that. Um, I've been an advisor for about five years, and it's amazing the opportunities that the Ohio Young Birder Club offers young kids. So the club ranges uh, from ages 13 to 18, and if you have a younger kid, so anyone in the audience, if you have someone younger than that, they do encourage them to come along to field trips and things like that. Oh, I do have a mouse. So they offer just a lot of different things to get kids interested. There's a lot of field trips, there's programs during COVID, there were uh, Zoom presentations. There, a lot of those were sponsored through Black Swamp Bird Observatory and they had um, like an at-home series so the kids could still be involved while we couldn't get out in person. In addition, you know, it's not just birds. You know, you've got a kid here holding a, holding a snake. You know, they just encourage a love of nature the importance of conservation. They offer a camp uh, every year. There's a, a variety of them around the country. They move locations. And then kids can get scholarships to visit these camps for a week-long in-depth birding experience. So, you know, you're just getting kids really involved in the hobby. And they do fundraising. They do like a big sit every year that raises a lot of money for an organization of their choice. There's a conference annually. So they have kids present at this conference. It's not a bunch of adults getting up and talking to kids about things. It's kids talking to kids about things, things they're passionate about. So getting them in front of an audience, giving them that life experience to talk in front of a crowd and talk about things they're passionate about, just a lot of opportunities they wouldn't get anywhere else. They also offer scholarships for college, so that's really helpful. I know the Columbus branch has done a whole bunch with bluebird houses. They monitor, they install them which is great since there's been such a decrease in our bluebird species over the, the bluebird numbers over the years. Uh, this is one of the conferences, the last in-person conference that we were at. I mean, look how many kids there are. This is fantastic. I mean, just a ton of youth. I mean, these are the people that are going to be protecting the birds as they grow older. That is why this is so important. And this is just, this is a great image. So the big sit a few years ago, they chose to donate to the Buckeye Ohio Lights Out program. So what that is is the Ohio Ornithology Club, which was founded four or five years ago, I believe, they uh, encourage campus and downtown Columbus to turn off their lights during migration. This prevents window strikes for birds migrating through. It's been a very successful program. So the big sit donated $1,000 to the program and every single one of the people you see pictured, with the exception of Laura Gerard on the right and the Kaufmans, or Gerard on the left and the Kaufmans on the right, all of those kids in the middle who are now part of the Ohio Ornithology Club doing this conservation work were Ohio young birders. Every single one. So it's like this great kind of full circle thing that, you know, they were interested as kids, they did the program, and they're, they're raising money and saving bird lives now. So a lot of these kids are now researchers, field workers. I mean, they truly are impacting conservation now as adults. So just if you're going to donate to a cause, OYBC is a good one. Get involved. They have a chapter here in Cleveland. Um, you saw the kids on the boat in the last image. That's Buster's group. He works with inner city kids to get them out in nature, you know, expose them to things that normally they wouldn't see. So volunteer, you know, maybe Black River could, you know, have a, a walk out here or something for them. It'd be really awesome. So really, really cool program. So just wanted to spend a little time on that. Ah, warblers. <laughs> How many people have been to McGee Marsh? Okay, pretty, pretty much everybody. And some of you may find that you had a very similar experience to the one that I had. It was about a decade ago. And I went to a festival 
had no idea what it was. My son here in the front row was a baby and he's, he'll be 11. And, um, we went to the parking lot of the, cons the, uh, Huntman's club that's there in the front. They were having a Raptor display of unreleasable birds. And I was like, wow, that's just really cool. Let's go check it out. So we kind of walked around and we we're like getting ready to leave the sportsman center. And someone said, Oh, have you been to the boardwalk? And I said, what boardwalk? <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea that there was a boardwalk, what it was, what it meant, what the festival was. So we went, um, my poor parents were along. I left my dad in the parking lot with my infant child like, we're just going to go check out. We'll just check out. Like, an hour and a half later, he's calling us. Where are you guys? What's happened to you? I'm like, I've only made it 100 feet in. There's birds everywhere. Like, I didn't know what any of this was. There were all these birds. They were colorful. They were low. They were everywhere. And I was shocked. I was shocked. I, I had never heard of warblers. You know, if you'd asked me how many species were in Ohio before that time, I would have said 15. <laughs> I didn't know. And I immediately, I had to know more. And it, boy, that slope was slippery. So <laughs> um, went right on down the rabbit hole on that one. But I'm sure a lot of you have had these experiences where you, you, you don't know until you know. And man, our warbler is a great thing to learn about. So when I, um, we're doing these at-home programs for Saberwing, since we weren't out touring, uh, I decided to go ahead and do a warbler presentation, which is where this, this program came from. And I was like really self-assured about it. I was like, oh, this would be an easy one. I know lots about warblers. No, no. I <laughs> found myself sitting on my living room floor just like surrounded by Macaulay Library pamphlets. And I, I just couldn't get enough. These guys are incredibly fascinating. You know, we get this little glimpse into their world every year for a couple weeks. So I really want to go into today... Uh, kind of what happens before, during, after. They're, they're very fascinating. So where did the name warbler come from? Early ornithologists in the United States um, didn't really know how to classify them. So they looked back home, what was similar. You know, they have grass warbler as kind of the bird that got modeled after this name. They're not even closely related. The old world warblers aren't genetically similar to our new world warblers at all. But they were similar in sh size, shape. Not many of them actually warble at all. If you think about black and white warblers, kind of a high-pitched seesaw sound, or you know, black pole is incredibly high and like a dee 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 dee. -de. It doesn't resemble warbling at all. But the you know the early, early ornithologists didn't know how to put them into a group. So it wasn't until the 1800s that they actually realized they were a completely different group and they got their own designation. So the actual definition of a warbler is any of a number of small insectivorous songbirds that typically have a warbling song. Even that's kind of, yes. Could you name the warblers once you bring them up on the screen? Sure. So Absolutely. Absolutely. This is an American red start male. And I'll be happy to do that. What was the previous one? Uh, black Bernie warbler. So, um, you know, this is a broad definition, but, you know, you've got 110 or so species in the warbler family group, which is called Perulidae, and they're all somewhat similar, but there's a lot of differences. In general, they, they are insectivores. They're very colorful. They're fast-moving, very active. Anyone who's ever tried to take a photo of one certainly knows that or get one in your binocular view, you see a lot of empty branches, you know. <laughs> um, and almost all are migratory. So we've got a magnolia warbler, bottom left, black burnian, followed by black-throated gray, yellow warbler, um, American red star, and a common yellow throat up at the top there. And they're all uh, small passerins, um, all about four to six inches long, give or take, weigh between eight and 10 grams, which is two nickels. So, I mean, th think about it. a ballpoint pen, you know, this is what a warbler weighs. Pretty impressive. Uh, 
there's about 50, 54 technically species of warbler in the U.S. They live about three to five years. The smallest is the Lucy's warbler, which is a western warbler over here on the right hand side. And the oven bird is our largest, just barely beaten out Swanson's warbler, and that's pictured up top here. A group of warblers is called a number of things, but my favorite is a bouquet. A bouquet of warblers. Also a confusion of warblers. Anyone who's been in a mixed flock situation surely know, understands that where that name came from. And then some of the species actually have their own classifications. Some of these just crack me up. So there's a derby of Kentucky warblers, a stew of oven birds, a wake of morning warblers, a reading of palm warblers, a skulk of Connecticut warblers, and sadly, a scarcity of Kirtland's warblers. Luckily, that's on, on the rise. So where did some of these names come from? Some of them make a lot of sense. You know, pine warbler. Yeah, that, that's a great name. That bird breeds and lives its life in pines. But some of these other ones are quite odd. Uh, you know, our, our early ornithologists were just kind of naming them where they found them. So you've got the Cape May warbler. George Ord discovered this bird in Cape May in 1811. It was not seen again in Cape May until 1920. <laughs> so not a very accurate description. Even now, it's, it's somewhat of a rare migrant to the eastern coast. It's just kind of an uncommon bypasser. Um, Alexander Wilson, God bless him, he, he tried hard, but man, he... He has a whole list here of things that he named incorrectly. Magnolia warbler just happened to land in a magnolia tree. They don't live anywhere near where those trees exist. They breed in the high boreal forests. Probably just stopped there briefly to grab a snack. Um, Tennessee, Nashville, Connecticut, same thing. These birds stopped there for maybe a couple days as they head north. These are northern breeding birds. So they have nothing to do with Nashville or Connecticut or Tennessee. Actually, Connecticut warbler in Connecticut is fairly hard to find. <laughs> and they're fairly hard to find regardless. But, um, and then you've got something like worm-eating war warbler. This is just a bird that things have changed as far as what we refer to things as. Caterpillars used to be referred to as worms. So that designation changed, but the name stuck. I mean, you will very rarely, if ever, see a worm-eating war warbler actually eat an earthworm. Uh, I'm sure they probably do it if they could. Uh, singing. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of time is spent on vocalizations. I'm sure any spring day you go out, you hear a ton of songs. About 60% of their day is spent vocalizing. You can see here we've got the Cape May warbler on the left. Uh, Louisiana water thrush in the middle bottom is blue-winged warbler. Right-hand side lower is black-throated green and black-throated blue up top. A typical bird will sing about 225 times an hour. That's, that's a lot of singing. Uh, a black-throated green was extra ambitious and actually has been recorded singing 466 times an hour. Not sure when they have time to breathe. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Um, there's a lot of reasons birds sing. Primary reason is to establish ta territory, to maintain territory, ward off other males that would like to invade their territory, and attract a mate. Song is a complex thing. It's innate, so birds are born with the ability to sing, but the song complexity comes from a learned behavior, so from their parents, from neighboring birds. The more complex a song, the more attractive of a mate they are. So they're born with the basics, and they you know, become Beyonce later. <laughs> Plumage is also very important. Um, birds with you know, feathers that aren't clean or in the right order can't fly. So preening is incredibly important. They spend about 15% of their day preening. Breeding season drops down to 5 to 10% as they're busy caring for young, which is why if you see a warbler in June, they're, they're looking pretty rough by that point. Uh, all birds have an oil gland at the base of their tail that they access, and they run that oil through their feathers every day, every single one, sometimes more than once. There's a, there's a number of ways that they clean in addition to that. They'll bathe in puddles or small streams. They'll scratch, uh, ruffle their feathers out. But feather care is incredibly important because without that, they can't fly. 
Birds will molt prior to migration. It's a huge amount of energy to do a full molt, but they wanna look their best as they come in for breeding season. So they will change from that basic plumage into their alternative plumage before they leave. And then usually again, they will molt again a second time after breeding season before they fly south. And you know, people talk a lot about confusing fall warblers. I, I hear that all the time. But really, only a handful of our warblers actually change plumages. There's, I think, eight to 10 that go into an, a basic plumage. Most of them keep their, their uh, stuff all year. So here's some that do, do change. I love photographing fall warblers and spend a lot of time doing it. Upper left, we've got a black Bernian warbler. Lower left, it's a bay-breasted. You can still see a little bit of the bay there on the sides. Center is northern perula. And lower is black pole. You can see those orange feet. And it's the only great way to tell between bay-breasted and black pole is they look very similar. Uh, upper right, we've got chestnut sided. And lower right, we've got Tennessee warbler, which I think looks much better in the fall. Get this like lemony, orangey goodness that's happening. And it's kind of awkward looking in the spring. So if you just think about what they look like in breeding season and imagine sliding a saturation slider backwards and desaturating them. A lot of times you come up with some of their basic plumage. Here's a number of other warblers that were shot in the fall. Look very similar to uh, their spring look. So common yellow throat never changes. Black throat to blue never changes. Black and white, maybe a little duller, but you can still tell what it is. Black throat to green, very, very close. So, you know, don't be scared to get out there in the fall. They're, <laughs> you know, just if, if you're not sure, you know, just think about what a bird may have looked like in the spring and desaturate. So what do warblers eat? We talked about them being insectivores, and they are primarily um, insects are their main food source. A lot of different things. Caterpillars are huge, which is why native plants are so important, because that's their main food source, along with a lot of other birds. But other larvae, leaf and bark beetles, weevils, ants, grasshoppers, crane flies. You know, we get the, all the crane flies and mayflies up at the lake they're annoying, but man, the birds really need them as a protein source. Gnats, spiders. They also eat um, a number of other things. Nectar, sap, plant buds. Occasionally you'll see them eating those. Berries, berry juice. Sometimes uh, like uh, the berries are too large, so they'll pierce them and just drink the juice right out instead. Uh, suet, even. If you have a suet feeder, sometimes you'll find a yellow rumped warbler or a pine warbler hanging off your feeder in the fall. Now, pine warblers are incredibly unique, that's the bird pictured here, because they have adapted to be able to eat seeds as their primary food source. So they will eat some insects, especially when they're feeding young baby warblers need to digest insects. And uh, Swainson's warbler has actually been documented to eat lizards. So small lizards. That's you know, not, not something you picture for a warbler. Um, one important part of a warbler's diet, especially for the northern boreal breeders, is spruce budworm. When you hear that word, people, oh no, yeah, it's a pest, it's a plague. And it is, but it's a naturally occurring one. It's one that is a cycle that's very important to the birds up there. They do destroy trees but the birds feast. Not just warblers, evening grosbeaks, a number of other boreal species depend on these spruce budworm outbreaks. So when you hear like Canada is gonna do a big pest spray, that's, that's, no, that's no good. It's not great for the wood industry, but it's great for the birds. So the breeding grounds. Uh, there's very, very high site fidelity. At, the, at these locations. So the same male will use the same patch year after year after year. Banding data has given us the ability to track this and catch these birds you know, in the same spot five years later. So the males are very territorial. They arrive first. They're very dominant um, over younger males. So the older they are, the more dominant they are. They um, can nest together cooperatively in the fact that if you have a patch of forest, each section of forest is used by different species. So you have the canopy section that you'll have a warbler in, there's a mid-story, 
Then there's like the scrub brush habitat and the ground. So you can have multiple species living cooperatively together in the same area without interfering too much. Mate selection is obviously an important part of their life cycle. The females choose, they choose their mate. It's based on age, plumage, overall condition is very important, song complexity, which we already talked about. And um, the males work really hard at getting the females' attention. They actually engage in some flight displays, which is really fun to watch. I've only seen it a handful of times, but they'll do kind of a hover flight or a downward spiral aerial display. And then of course they sing, you know, up to 466 times an hour to get, to get her attention. Um, the females are actually quite uh, protective of their males once they're chosen. So they will also engage in aggressive displays against other females and males. Once they're paired up, um, it happens pretty quickly, about 40, 48 to hours or so, 24 to 48 hours. And then they'll begin pair bonding. Typically, mate selection is monogamous for the year. Not always. Um, but once that pair has decided, they'll stay together through fledgling. Once the, the young fledge, they're out. <laughs> so, there's been documented studies that show that the same female male may mate again the next year. But typically, they find somebody else. Uh, hooded warbler, red-faced uh, Kentucky, common yellow throat, and prairie are all non-monogamous. So they, the males will mate with multiple females. And Wilson's warbler is quite the player. He actually will have a breeding group or harem. So <laughs> now some of this is probably because there's more males than females. But I kind of like to think of him as like a sly dog. <laughs> oh. Uh, Louisiana water thrush pair. These are northern perulas, a pair of them here. Uh, the females in the front, males in the back. You can see how she's uh, lighter colored. Not by much, but you can see like the distinct orange patch on the male in the background. So pair bonding, the, uh, <coughs> the pair works together to select a nesting site. Once that is selected, the female does most of the work. They're both, both very protective of the nesting area, they'll chase others out, the female and male. You know, there's kind of a misconception that the males are the only ones that are aggressive and protective, but the females will as well. Uh, the male will feed the female throughout this time, kind of to establish that bond. I mean, it's a good plan, right? Like, bring me tacos. Um, I'll be your girlfriend, it's great. Um, the, the bond is broken, like I said, after fledgling. Like, they kind of hang out, feed the babies, but then, then they're out, so. Nest building. This is a female yellow warbler. She's gathering spider webs. There's only two species that don't build nests at all. Lucy's warbler and prothonotary warbler nest in cavities, which is a little bit different situation. They, I mean, they build a nest within the cavity, but they don't build a typical nest like other birds do. The female builds almost exclusively in all the species. The exception would be Louisiana water thrush, split the task 50-50. Uh, nests are made out of a lot of different materials, grasses, lichens, moss, pine needles, feathers, uh, animal hair. If you get on YouTube, you probably see an industrious palm warbler like plucking dog hair out of a sleeping dog on a back porch. So it's usually deer hair, but sometimes, sometimes dogs. It takes about two full days to build a nest. For example, uh, 143 trips on day one, 59 trips on day two, and then a little clean up the other two days, seven trips on day three, four trips on day four. So the whole process can take three to nine days, but most of it's done within the first 24 to 48 hours. Overall, most species nest off the ground, some in very high canopy, some mid. Um, there are some that nest on the ground, Oven bird, it's where it gets its name from. It nests on the ground, makes a nest kind of dome shaped, kind of looks like a Dutch oven. But black and white warbler, uh, Kentucky warbler, water thrushes, both species all nest on the ground, worm eating, Wilson's. 
a few nests just off the ground, red-faced warbler and um, can, uh, Kirtland's warbler, both nests just a couple feet off the ground. This is a yellow warbler nest. Typically, nests contain two to six eggs, and um, the spruce budworm outbreak that we talked about, that's so important for nesting because the clutch size increases dramatically. So the birds that nest up there, particularly like Cape May warbler, have been documented to have up to nine eggs in a nest, which is a ton. So that number jumps from two to six on average to four to seven for the species that are up up north in the boreal forest during that outbreak. So it's very resource-based. If there's a lot of resources around, bigger clutch sizes. If it's a drought, having a tough year, you may only see one or two eggs. Total incubation time is about 10 to 13 days, almost exclusively, again, done by the female. You're seeing a pattern here, aren't we? <laughs> Uh, now, Kirtland's warbler and northern perula have both been documented to spend some time sitting on the nest incubating. One really interesting piece is the females can actually delay hatching if weather turns bad, if the resources suddenly stop. She can actually regulate egg temperature and control when those eggs hatch. So if you get a cold snap for a few days she'll hold off on having those eggs hatch. It's a survival mechanism to get, you know, the best chance at having your chicks survive. So very cool stuff. I mean, we can't do that as humans at all. So, you know. Um, eggs come in a variety of colors, just all over the board here. White, gray, chestnut, pink, um, brown, spotted, blue. I mean, it really varies depending on the species. Most warblers have one clutch of eggs a year, but a few have two. Uh, most widely known ones are black-throated blue, yellow-throated warbler, and northern perula. Yes? Uh, which warbler was able to moderate the hatching of their eggs? All of them. All of them. Yeah. As long as we're on that, how, is there any sense of how they, that's done? There's some, there's some papers out there. I mean, they just incubate less. Or I, I, I wouldn't actually, I don't actually know the specifics. I know that they can regulate the temperature so they don't, so they kind of grow slower. It's wildly fascinating stuff. Very cool. So, and that's, that's a thing with most bird species, actually, that they can delay the nesting, especially like the Arctic species that nest up north. Very cool. Um, so prothonotary warblers are known for their double clutching. The older, more um, experienced females will arrive quite early in preparation to be able to have two clutches a year. I, and it's funny that they do this because by the second clutch, they must be really sick of kids because um, they, they engage in a process called egg dumping. So they'll lay a couple eggs in their own nest and then they'll go pawn a couple off next door, except for next door also is pawning some off. So in general, prothonotary warblers are raising about 30% of the time chicks that aren't their own. So they'll have a couple in their nest that are theirs, but all of them are kind of raising each other's babies, which is hilarious. I mean, I guess two, two nests a year would wear somebody out. Um, Brown-headed cowbirds are a major nest parasite for all warbler species. And if you're not familiar with what, what brown-headed cowbirds do, I mean, I think it's smart. They drop off an egg, they skip all the overnight, you know, not, you know, no sleep times with their babies and pick them up when they're cool and they can hang out. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mason. <laughs> uh, but what they do, so the, those birds would follow the bison in, in the past. It's not really a thing now, but, um, you know, they couldn't stay on a nest, so they leave their eggs and have another, another bird raise them, and ultimately the bird would rejoin the flock. H however, it's really bad for the other species because the babies are extremely large. They take all the resources, they push the others out of the nest, and the parent is unwillingly feeding you know, this massive cowbird baby that's like three times the size of them. So a lot of people don't care for cowbirds. I think it's smart. I lost a lot of sleep in the infant years, you know? I'm just be pretty nice to just pick them up later. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm kidding. <laughs> Not really. Uh, so, um, but it is an issue. It's so much that, like, the Kirtland's warblers, they had to bring in management and eliminate cowbirds from that area. Even though they are a protected species, Kirtland's were endangered, and they were really having a hard time raising their own babies because cowbirds would get in there and they'd be raising cowbirds instead. So big nest parasite and a, a tough issue for all warblers. Oh, baby warbler. Not terribly cute. Um, but they get cute quick. Uh, they're fed by both parents. The, the females a lot more than the males, of course. Uh, for example, one black-throated green pair, the female fed 245 times and the male fed 11. <laughs> really, really bad dad work on the, the warbler front. Um, and it's actually been documented, and this is hilarious, uh, the male warbler will feed the babies incorrectly. So he'll show up and try to feed like a almost fledgling like they were a nestling. So it's like the equivalency of showing up with a baby bottle for your 13 year old. You're like, here you go, broad dinner home. <laughs> so like they, they really are, they try, but man, just not, not doing a very good job. So it's not a ton of work. Day one, you've got about 16 trips starting on day one, but by the day before fledgling, you're all the way up to about 70 trips a day to feed these babies and get them ready to fledge. Fledgling time is typically eight to 12 days. And then those birds can typically fly three to five days later. So you're talking on the low end birth to flight in 11 days. Just incredible. Like I, it's hard to even process that being able to happen. I mean, you know, it takes 18 years to raise one of these. Um, <laughs> Uh, the parents will continue to feed them for several weeks afterwards and uh, up until the point that they're leaving for migration. There's a lot of dangers at the, at the nest site. Uh, parents will defend the nest. They'll defend by mobbing, scolding, dive bombing. Everyone's familiar with kill deer and how they do the broken wing display. Warblers will do the same. Uh, a number of species actually engage in those in those type of displays or act like a fledgling, kind of hop around to draw them away. And but there's a lot of predation out there, you know, a lot of animals like, you know, we've got squirrels, foxes, skunks, snakes, other birds, feral cats or outdoor cats in general. A uh, lot of issues that these birds face that they're trying to protect their young from. One of the, the weirder predators that I recently found out about while doing this research is a Chuck's Will's widow was found with a Cape May warbler in its stomach. So you've got one of these big night jars with this big gaping mouth that swoops around to get insects while well, he took a warbler overnight. So I mean there's a lot of threats these guys. I wouldn't think Chuck's Will's widow would be one of them but what an interesting food item for that bird. It's a big bug. Fall migration. So in general, spring migration is very rushed. You know, everybody's anxious. You know, it takes a very short amount of time once they leave to get up north because they want to get to the breeding grounds. They want to establish that territory. They need to get their young raised and back home before the weather turns. They want to take advantage of all of these resources. But fall migration is not like that. It's, it's much more relaxed. Here in our area, it starts uh, mid-August, late August. Things start moving down. But it lasts all the way through mid-October. So the birds move down, they feed, um, they always molt first, and the parents leave first. The young come after. And I, I can't imagine, you know, these birds are only a couple months old and they're engaging in this huge long distance flight by themselves. So they kind of group up with other siblings or other, other warblers and fly down together. And the first year, typically, those birds take a different route than what they do their second year. So the first time they go down, they follow the Atlantic coast and they take that all the way down and then jump the Gulf and go from there. But the second year, they must figure out something that saves them time or energy because they'll stay inland instead. So it's must be a learning process for sure. OK, 
Got the wintering grounds next. This is a palm warbler for everyone. Uh, not all birds leave the U.S., so they do migrate, but a number of species just stay in Florida or Texas or Arizona or the southern part of the U.S. So palm warbler, pine warbler, yellow-throated warbler, yellow-rumped warbler, many of these birds just stay year-round because there's enough resources for just them down south. The site fidelity is quite low, so the birds will fly to their area, but they won't have a spot like they do for the, for the breeding portion of their lives. They'll many times associate with a tropical flock, so tanagers and other honey creepers, small birds. They'll engage in active mobbing and scolding behavior, which is something that they don't really do here. And they kind of assimilate like the locals. They'll eat fruit while they're on uh, migration, which why wouldn't you? I mean, fresh papaya sounds great. So yeah, here we got a, got a papaya right here, a Tennessee warbler. It was taken in Costa Rica. This bird was sitting on a, a fruit, just snacking. Very weird to see, honestly. But why do they even migrate? So, you know, they're taking this huge risk. They're flying thousands of miles. They've got all this stuff they've got to worry about. Why don't they just stay? Costa Rica is lovely if you've been to the tropics, you know. <laughs> Anywhere down there seems nice. But it's all about resources. You know, when they're there, everything's in season. It's their rainy season. There's tons of resources, tons of fruit. By the time they need to leave, those resources have been depleted. So there's not enough for them and resident birds and babies. And then you think about our forests during the summer. I mean, you've got tons of insects and bugs and berries and you know, they're coming all this way to ensure their family will have the best possible chance at survival. So there's not enough resources to share down south. So that is why they make this huge trek every year to take advantage of our very bountiful season in spring and summer. And how do they migrate? Well, there's a lot of research ongoing in this area. I mean, what would we do without GPS at this point? I had to use it to get here today. Like, but for warblers, there's, a new, there's some new research that's just out that there is a migration gene. So while you know, your parents have passed to you your eye color and hair color, warblers' parents pass a map, a genetic map of where they go, where they come back from, when, and this, some new stuff that's being peer researched right now, but it's, and this is for all species that migrate. So really incredibly fascinating. I mean, can you imagine taking off with no map, no GPS, and you've got to fly to South America and just figure it out? And, and they get there and, and they get back and they get back to the same spot again. It's just absolutely incredible. So lots of really interesting stuff happening research-wise, and we're able to figure a lot of this out with a lot of the new GPS data transmitters that they're putting on these birds and bird banding, which is why it's so important to have these sort of resources so we can find out how these guys manage such an incredible feat. So I'll go through all the species here. I'll go left to right, top to bottom. So we've got black-throated blue, Wilson's warbler, northern perula, blackburnian, Kentucky, magnolia, black-throated green, Canada, blue wings, prothonotary, golden winged, and a female American red start. So we've talked a lot about what makes a warbler a warbler, what they have in common, and, and how they're alike. But I'd like to focus on a few special species that have some very different stuff going on. First up, we have olive warbler. Olive warbler is not a warbler at all. It has warbler in its name, looks like a warbler, kind of sounds like a warbler. It is not part of the Perulidae species. It has its own designation. It's Pusidromidae. I'm probably pronouncing these wrong, by the way, but it's as close as I could figure out how to pronounce it. Um, it's the only one in its genus. It lives in the western part of the US. Mexico gets into New Mexico and Arizona. It nests very high in longleaf pines at high elevation, so you could find them like on Mount Lemmon in Arizona or Mount Graham. 
and they're much closer related to the ascenters in Europe than they are our warblers. So ascenters are very small sparrow-like birds that are found uh, throughout Europe, but they've, they've got their own thing going on. But they do look a lot like warblers, so that is by far the most different warbler as it's not one. Most impressive flight, one of my favorite birds, black pole warbler. I'm just, just take a moment to take in these numbers. Annually, this bird flies 25,000 miles every year. And they've recorded a, a, one of these being almost 10 years old. So, I mean, like, go to the moon and back over its lifetime. They, uh, they nest all over the northern part of Canada and into Alaska. And the ones on the west, northwest side of the country, they don't just come straight down. No, they traverse the entire length of the country from west to east. And they have longer wings, actually, the, uh, the ones that live in the western part versus the eastern to complete this incredible flight. So they get to the Atlantic coast, and then they engage in this incredibly long 72-hour, 1,800-mile nonstop flight across the ocean to the northern part of South America. Like, this is a bird that weighs this much. It will double its fat resources before it leaves. You imagine humans trying to do that? Like, there would be cheeseburgers you have to eat. <laughs> you know, I, even our best athletes pale in comparison to this incredibly tiny songbird. You think of how efficient a bird must be to, to fly nonstop for 72 hours? It's just hard to process. And I, I just love this bird because it's, it's unassuming. You know, it's not one of our flashier warblers. It's black and white. It does have great legs. Let's check out these orange legs. It's great, right? Um, but it's just really, it's, it's a mind-boggling thing. So when I see them here, and I was lucky enough, I was in Colombia earlier this year, and I saw a black pole warbler in Colombia, and I was like, oh, you made it! Like, it was so exciting to see, like, the whole the whole circle, but really just, and, and this is just one of many. I mean, a lot of these birds undertake similar flights, none quite as extraordinary as this. Another kind of interesting note about black pole, most bird songs happen between 1,000 and 8,000 hertz, somewhere in that range. They sing at 10,000 hertz, so incredibly high. Um, so ultimately, most of us, human-wise, we get to the point we can't even hear them sing because they get such a high decibel. Ah, red-faced warbler. We've talked about bad dads. Red-faced warbler really takes the cake. He, is, he gets the award for laziest dad for sure. So the female builds a nest, <coughs> lays eggs, incubates. Somewhere around 10 to 15 feet away, uh, the male red-faced warbler will build some shoddy half version of a nest and go sit in it. <laughs> so he's built himself his own man cave. <laughs> away from wife and kids and doesn't really participate in the feeding. He'll just sit in his little crappy nest that's like half built for the most of the breeding season. So, you know, it's, it's hilarious. He's the only one that does this. So while, um, while red-faced warbler is out there, you know, watching the game with the guys, you got Canada warbler, who is an excellent dad. He is the primary caretaker of young. So he feeds more than the female. He is the only warbler dad to go above and beyond what the female does. So good job, Canada warbler. Now, there's a lot of good warbler moms out there, but yellow warbler, yellow warbler wins. We talked about cowbird nest parasites. Yellow warbler is the only one that will realize that there is a cowbird egg in its nest. Now, she can't throw it out. They're too heavy. So what she'll do is she'll build a new nest on top of it. And they have documented up to seven levels high that she has built nest upon nest upon nest upon nest because she refuses to raise some big giant baby. And uh, they actually, there's like a whole great state. If anyone's going to Biggest Week, Sarah Winicky is giving a great presentation on cowbirds and some of this information in her mixes. So I suggest checking out because it's really fascinating stuff. But Yellow warblers actually behave incredibly differently. If, if they hear a cowbird call note, 
their behavior changes for up to 24 hours. They're wary. They're watching. They're like anticipating a possible egg drop. So their behavior is completely different. So they're the only ones that have it figured out. So good job, Yellow Warbler. Best memory goes to Hooded Warbler. They actually will identify past neighbors. They'll remember what they sound like. You know, they'll say, well, oh, cool, like Bob's back. I don't have to go fight with him because he'll be in his space and I'll be in mine. So it actually saves a lot of resources, energy, fighting, singing. He can just work on raising young, feeding his mate, defending his territory from other birds. But if he hears his neighbors from last year, all's good. All's good. Also, um, they're the only warbler species that segregate male and female. So the females live in kind of a low scrubby area. The males live mid to upper canopy. And they never really associate. So he must also remember how hard it is to live with a spouse sometimes. <laughs> Smart guy. Kirtland's warbler has got to be like the best neighbor. They do this great breeding colony situation. So they kind of look out for each other. Uh, for predators, they share resources, and they kind of they kind of work together in a colony style situation. It's the only only warbler that does this. And then they must like each other so much they all go to the Bahamas together and hang out all winter long. So the whole group spends most of their time in Bahamas or Turks and Caicos. I mean the whole population. So they're very very exclusive with where they go every year. Best to assimilate, give that award to Tennessee Warbler. Uh, we've got a slaty flower piercer here on the right, so not a warbler, but if you can see, it's performing its namesake uh, activity, flower piercing. So they'll pierce the bottom of a flower and drink the nectar. Tennessee Warbler has learned how to do this. They have watched and picked up this habit, and I've actually witnessed Tennessee Warblers following flower piercers and drinking nectar behind them. So they've, they've got that figured out. Um, they also, like you saw earlier, they, they love the tropics. They eat fruit when they're down there. So they've really, they've really worked well into settling into their tropical winter home. Yellow rumped warbler is amazing at its cold weather abilities. They have actually adapted their stomachs to digest waxes and bayberries. So they are able to stay much further north than any other species. Most um, do go down to Florida, but a, a number of population will stay here all winter. Like you can find a yellow warbler many times on Christmas bird counts. And they've been known to overwinter as far north as Nova Scotia if there's a good berry crop because they can eat berries where other warblers cannot. The best acrobat would be black and white warbler. If you've seen black and white warblers out, anybody seen them like climbing trees, hanging upside down? It's because they have this exceptionally long back toe, much longer than any other warbler species, which allows them to grip and climb much like a creeper or a woodpecker would. So they're able to move up and down trees, hang upside down, a lot of things other warblers can't do. Kate May Warbler, uh, they're the best snackers because they have adapted to be able to drink nectar. They have a, a special tongue. It's a tubular style tongue. Go ahead. Go ahead and say it. Mason wants me to say that it's totally tubular. <laughs> So they, so they will drink nectar from, from flowers, unlike a lot of other species, and they're able to do so with this uh, great adaptation. Wrong way. Ah, best at fighting crime. Prothonotary warbler. Incredibly interesting story from the Cold War era. There was a lot of, you know, things going on with communists back then. So there, were, there was a man, his name was Whitaker Chambers. He was accused of espionage in the United States. He was trying to get himself a good deal, so he was going to name his co-conspirator to get a break. Alger Hiss was the man he named. Now Hiss said 
he never knew this guy. They're, they're testifying in front of the Un-American Committee of the House of Representatives, and he says, I don't know this man. I'm not a spy. I'm not a communist. Well, in private, Chambers said, well, I do know Hiss. Here's a little tidbit about him that no one else would know if we weren't friends. Hiss is an amateur ornithologist, and he bragged to me about seeing a prothonotary warbler on the Potomac River. So later, during trial, the prosecutors brought up Hiss's hobbies. Hiss did, in fact, on the stand confirm that he had seen a prothonotary warbler on the Potomac. The prosecution said, oh, see, these guys do know each other. You know, we were told about this in private. Hiss now confirmed it on the stand. Clearly, these two men know each other. Hiss argued until his death that he would have told anyone anywhere, friend or not, that he had seen a prothonotary warbler on the Potomac, as most people do when they see an exciting bird. However, Chambers did get no time at all, and Hiss served five years for perjury for being involved in espionage against the United States. Also during this trial was the rise of Richard Nixon, who was um, just a member of Congress at this time, but he kind of kept pressing during the proceedings of this particular trial and kind of thrust himself into the spotlight. So the prothonotary warbler had its day in court and en ended up getting a poor old Alger Hiss convicted of perjury. <laughs> so at the beginning of this program, we talked about the definition of what is a warbler. Insectivore small bird, but it's, there's so much more than that. It's more than a textbook definition. It's more than just a bird. It's a bird that's had a huge impact on my life. You know, it, it just, they're the epitome of beauty. That's the definition of a warbler. They do these incredible feats of stamina and endurance. They're resilient, fierce, impressive, tough. They're, in, they're anticipation. I can't wait for warbler season every year. I, you know, it's, it's something I look forward to every April. I'm like, oh yeah, bring it on. You know, their excitement. Once they're here, I mean, it's just an incredible feeling. And, and they're a community. People travel from all over the world to get a small glimpse into these birds' lives. And they have really made a huge impact on me. And I'm very humbled to have talked with you guys about them today. Thank you. Any questions? Ooh. Any questions? Besides Mickey and Marsh, where do you like to hang out? Oh, there's a lot of places. McGee is actually one of the last places I go. <laughs> Photo-wise, it's tough. There's a lot of sticks and um, stuff. Although the big trees are down now and everything's going to be low, I know everyone's worried about the boardwalk and like, oh no, the big tree. Yeah, everything's going to be low now. It's going to be awesome. Um, Love Mommy Bay State Park. Uh, there's a lot of uh, places out here. Wendy Park out here by you guys is really, really good. I mean, if you really want to see these birds well, go to the breeding habitat. Go to the northern part of lower Michigan, eastern Pennsylvania, has a huge number of breeding species in the Poconos. I mean, black burning warbler, magnolia warbler, um, along with a lot of other species. Southern Ohio gets a ton of species that McGee never sees unless there's an overshoot day. You know, worm eating warbler, cerulean, all of those are down south. So there's a lot of places to go. I recommend using eBird if there's a particular warbler you've not seen to be able to uh, check out and see where they're being seen at. But yeah, lots and lots and lots of places to go. I love McGee, don't get me wrong, but there's a million places to go see warblers. Yes? Are they going to do the biggest week of birding this year? They are. It's live in person. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah, go check it out. Anybody else? Who's excited about seeing warblers soon? <laughs> All right, thank you guys.